Hello, my friends. It's a new liturgical year. We begin with the first Sunday of Advent. I'm in the new purple workbook for lectors on page, page, uh, where is it? One, page one, the first Sunday of Advent. Begin with a reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah, and I'll be reading at the bottom of the page, the commentary below. The opening of the book of Isaiah recount, the opening verses of the book of Isaiah recount the kings who reigned in Judah during Israel's, Isaiah's time, indicating that the prophet's ministry spanned four decades, ending about 701 BC. Some scholars think it may have been even longer. During this time, Judah repeatedly turned to foreign alliances for protection against the expanding might of Assyria, which led an, a, an unsuccessful attack on Jerusalem. So Assyria is a country, and I know I've heard them many times before. I always have to look things, things up. But Assyria exists in an area now of northern Iraq, southern Turkey, and parts of Syria, which is, by my estimation, is roughly the um, area um, where the Kurds live and, uh, and, and <laughs> ironically, where ISIL is. And um, it's this, this, these are the, the people that are involved in that are the, the ones who had um, led the attack on Israel. So it's been going on a while. The prophet repeatedly called Judah to trust in divine rather than human power, but with little success. Many of Isaiah's prophecies charged the people with infidelity to their covenant with the Lord. They were failing to worship sincerely or ensure social justice, and they must repent. Other prophecies spoke of God's coming judgment and future divine rule over God's people and all nations. Today's first reading focuses on the second motif. In verses previous to the reading, Isaiah has rebuked the people for numerous transgressions and called them to return to God. And uh, I'm going to read some of that to you, too. So this is uh, the beginning of, of Isaiah. And I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's uh, It would take too long, but I just want to read parts of it. So this is entitled The Indictment of Israel and Judah. It, the first chapter is Israel's Sinfulness. The vision which Isaiah, son of Amos, had concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, king of Judah. Hear, O heavens, and listen, O earth, for the Lord has the Lord speaks. Sons have I raised and reared, but they have disowned me. An ox knows its owner, and an ass its master's manger, but Israel does not know. My people has not understood. I'll skip down. Unless the Lord of hosts has left us a scanty remnant, we had become as Sodom. We should be like Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, princes of Sodom. Listen to the instructions of our God, people of Gomorrah. What care I for the number of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I've had enough of whole burnt rams and fat of fatlings. In the blood of calves, lambs, and goats I find no pleasure. When you come in and visit me, who asks these things of you? Trample my courts no more, etc. He goes on. Come now, let us set things right, says the Lord. Though your sins be like scarlet, they may become white as snow. Though they become crimson red, they may become white as wool. And he goes on. So he's, he's, he's really laying it thick on them, on, on how they have been unfaithful. And this is where our uh, reading picks up then. Then he has another chapter, which begins the same way as the last one. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and, and is Judah and Jerusalem. So that's the introduction, and you say that as the off-screen announcer or whatever. And um, if you look over to the left, it says this, this is an exhortatory reading, announcing Israel's glorious future and, and, and fullness of the reign of God. Keep your emotions and energy up throughout. Um, popular media, make, media makes the end times bleak. Isaiah's view is different. Make us know this vision is good news. And then when you when you describe it, really see the vision. Proclaim with emotions. Uh, when you get down to the bottom, it says, how does a peaceful world make you feel? When it talks about uh, beating your sh swords into plowshares, etc., that how does that make you feel? I mean, I mean, right now, if you were to think that there would never be another... Um, uh, 
bombing or, or um, a terrorist attack or anything. That would be pretty nice, I think. And so that's, that's the kind of piece that we want to think about. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest mountain and raised above the hills. All nations shall stream toward it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us climb the Lord's mountain to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may instruct us in his ways, and we may walk in his paths. For from Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and impose terms on many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. One nation shall not raise the sword against another, nor shall they train for war again. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. The word of the Lord. There was one thing I wanted to mention before I did that reading, and uh, in the middle of it, there's a part which is a quotation, where it says, many people come and say, and then you are, you are reading the text that these many peoples have to say. You've really got to have a different tone of voice when, you, when you're doing that. And then when you shift over from he may walk in their past, then you're going again to uh, a narration. You're telling the story. So you, you've got to shift your voice somehow. It, uh, otherwise, it, it just really doesn't carry it very well. Let's move on. Um, so it explains, an exhortatory text makes an urgent appeal to listeners. They may encourage, warn, or challenge, and often include a call to action. You must convey the urgency and passion behind the words. Um, the next one is a didactic text. The didactics, didactic means it teaches something or has a moral instruction. Um, I'll read the commentary below. Paul composed the letter to the Romans near the end of his life, and it stands as, as his most systematic writing, more a treatise or essay than a letter. What we hear today appears near the end of this lengthy work. In earlier chapters, the apostle explains his conviction that no one is saved through the works of the law, but rather by God's utterly free, unearned gift of divine love poured out to humankind through Christ. Paul discusses the implications of this gift, instructing his audience about how they are to live their lives, their new life in Christ, a phrase that appears frequently in his readings. Immediately before today's reading, Paul sums up his instructions for Christian living by referring to the commandment to love one's neighbor as oneself, the commandment that brings the law to completion. Today's second reading provides the reason for Christians to live according to this law of love. The final fulfillment of God's plan for salvation is near at hand. In the earliest decades of Christianity, Jesus' followers believed that God's definitive act of salvation began with the ministry, death, and resurrection of Christ, and would soon reach culmination with his imminent return. Paul stresses that Christians must now act in accord with the new life already begun in Christ, and soon to be completed with his coming in glory. His closing admonition to resist desires of the flesh encompasses all that opposes the law of love. Christians must have nothing to do with behaviors common to the Roman world of his day, several of which he names, those who continue to live in the Spirit, the abiding presence of God's love, freely given in Christ, will surely live in the divine command of love. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, you know the time. It is the hour now for you to awake from sleep. For our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is advanced. The day is at hand. Let us then throw off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us conduct ourselves properly as in the day, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in promiscuity and lust, not in rivalry and jealousy, but put on 
the Lord Jesus Christ, and make no provisions for the desires of the flesh. The word of the Lord. Finally, we move to the gospel reading. Now we are in uh, the gospel of Matthew. This is the first weekend when we are doing that. Um, and we'll be that way for the rest of the liturgical year. I'm reading at the bottom of page three. This page appears in what is usually called Paul's Apocalypse, chapters 24, 25 of Matthew's account. Jewish expectation about God's final act of salvation took various forms, but in New Testament times, the most common view was apocalyptic. This view envisioned numerous calamities on earth and in the heavens, signaling the arrival of the end times, followed by divine judgment to determine who would or would not be part of God's new world. In the earlier part of chapter 24, Matthew reflects several characteristics of apocalyptic thinking. Jesus speaks seated on the Mount of Olives, the place Zechariah 14.4 associates with God's final coming, and warns of impending wars, persecutions, and other earthly calamities, along with cosmic disturbances. Today's gospel stresses that the time of God's coming is unknown. Therefore, believers must always be prepared. As the great flood caught people unawares, the sign or the coming of the Son of Man will also arrive in God's own time. Matthew uses the Greek word parousia, here translated coming, which in Roman society referred to a ruler's visitation to a city or the arrival of a deity bringing salvation to the people. Christians adapted the word, combining both meanings to speak of God's coming to complete God's final rule, which began in his ministry. For that coming, Christians must always be prepared. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said to his disciples, As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. In those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day that Noah entered the ark. They did not know until the flood came and carried them all away. So will it be also at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be out in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one will be left. Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know on which day your Lord will come. Be sure of this. If the master of the house had known the hour of night when the thief was coming, he would he would have stayed awake and not let his house be broken into. So too you also must be prepared. For at an hour you do not expect, the Son of Man will come. The Gospel of the Lord. Thank you all very much and God bless. <clears throat>